Hello everyone, it's my privilege to share with you again today and we're back in John's Gospel, chapter 14. We'll read the latter half of the chapter beginning at verse 15 and it's headed up here in the NIV, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. If you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realise that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them, is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You heard me say I am going away, and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. I can remember sitting in Latin classes at school, absolutely bored to tears. Forty minutes of declining irregular verbs seemed more like forty days and nights in the wilderness to me. Now, it wasn't entirely the teacher's fault, though the rather aptly named Miss Gray was not the most inspiring of teachers. She was, to be honest, a little bit frumpy and her voice was nerve-shatteringly squeaky. And about the only thing I can remember really from my three years of purgatory are the different case endings for the Latin word for war and how to respond to Miss Gray's start of class greeting. Neither of which I've had very much use for during these past 50 years or so. What a contrast to the situation we find here in John 14. The disciples weren't sitting at desks, they were probably still reclining at the supper table in the upper room. The subject was not some dead and buried language, but what was going to happen to them when their master finally left them. And that master and teacher, of course, was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And I would suggest that the disciples' attitude at this point was altogether different to what mine was in my second year at Weymouth Grammar. The twelve, I'm pretty sure, would have been on the edge of their couches, drinking in every word that the Master was saying. I'm pretty sure they all had a growing sense that something momentous was about to happen and that this was the lull before the storm. Jesus' whole demeanour seemed different somehow. He seemed somewhat subdued, suggesting a preoccupation with other things, weightier things that were on his mind. So as they listened, it was possibly with the somewhat ominous feeling that the end of their relationship, as they knew it, was getting very near. It's hard for us, isn't it, to sit in any of the disciples' places. It's difficult to know exactly what was going on in their minds. But Jesus knew precisely what they were thinking and exactly how they were feeling, which is why he said what he said in these verses. 
He'd already given them some pretty wonderful promises with regard to their long-term future, and now he begins to share his plans for them in the interim period between his leaving them and their heavenly reunion. Those plans and purposes seem to fall into two categories. First, what Jesus will do for them, and secondly, what the disciples must do for him. It's what I'm calling promises and precepts. Promises and precepts. Let's look at the promises first. What Jesus will do for them. A vicar was trying to reassure one of his elderly parishioners one day in the light of his forthcoming move to another parish. Don't worry yourself, he said. The next vicar will be much better man than I am. That's what the last three ministers said, replied the old lady, and they all got it wrong. Here we find Jesus reassuring his disciples in the light of his imminent departure. So what does he actually promise them? Well, I find three precious promises in these verses. But before I take you through them, I want you to notice that each of them are actually dependent upon Jesus going away. Just as the promise that he makes about the father's house is dependent on him going to get things ready. So these interim benefits are contingent upon him leaving them. They will come as a consequence of him going back to the Father. Here's the first of these promises. He will send them another advocate. Verse 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate or helper or encourager or counsellor to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. Now forgive me if you've heard this explanation before but John used a very specific word when he recorded the phrase that the NIV translates another advocate. The Greeks you see had two different words that both meant another. To quote the Greek scholar W.E. Vine, allos denotes another of the same sort whilst heteros denotes another of a different sort. So which did John use to give us the gist of what Jesus was saying to his disciples. Answer, alos, another of the same sort. Well, let me il illustrate that. I I'm in the process of, of buying another computer. And if I was telling you that in Greek, I'd be using the word heteros. The computer I'm selling is a desktop. The computer I'm buying is a laptop. The desktop is pretty slow. The new one is lightning fast. The old one has a big screen. The new one has a very small screen. It's a heteros replacement, because to use another of Mr. Vine's terms, there's a qualitative difference between the two. Are you with me? As John endeavoured to convey the literal meaning of what Jesus originally said here, he used the word alos, meaning another of the very same kind. The advocate that Jesus would send would be of the same kind and nature and calibre as himself. And who is this advocate? Well, Jesus calls him the spirit of truth, but we more frequently refer to him as the Holy Spirit. To put it another way, Jesus implied that in the spirit's coming will be his own coming. I don't know how else to put it, really. It's something of a mystery. But as William Hendrickson said in his commentary, father and son in and through the spirit are ever by the side of those who love their Lord. What a glorious thought. That is. So then, what would this advocate do for them exactly? Well, perhaps the first thing to say is that John's word parakletos literally means to call alongside. William Barclay brings this word alive beautifully when he says a parakletos might be an advocate called in to plead the cause of someone under a charge which would issue in serious penalty. He might be an expert called in to give advice in some difficult situation or a person called in when a company of soldiers were depressed and dispirited to put new courage into their minds and their hearts. That's the richness of this term, parakletos. The Holy Spirit will do all of these things for us and more. Secondly, he'll make the presence of Jesus real to the believer. I've already hinted at this, but I want to underline it. Jesus was 
Well, Jesus leaving was not the disaster it must have seemed for the disciples. For this reason, he was going to quickly return to them in the person of the Spirit. When did that happen? Well, it happened on the day of Pentecost. As I said earlier, the Spirit is so much one with the Son and so much one with the Father that when the Spirit comes, it's as though the Father and Son come too. Again, we're in the the realm of mystery, but, but when a person becomes a true believer in Jesus, when they repent and receive Christ as Saviour and Lord, the Spirit of God comes to indwell that person, which means that God takes up residence in that person's life. And so through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, the new believer enters into a new relationship with the risen Jesus and the eternal Father. Hallelujah. The world cannot accept him, said Jesus, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Thirdly, it's part of the Spirit's work to teach us and remind us of Jesus' teaching. John has more to say about this a little bit later in his discourse, but the point he's making is that the Spirit will continue what Christ had begun. How wonderful this is, that as we read and study the Bible, the Holy Spirit who breathed it out is right alongside us to help us understand it and apply it to our own situations. So that's the first of Jesus' three promises regarding the period between his return to the Father and the disciples' reunion with him in heaven. He will send them another counsellor, one just like himself, who will encourage them and inspire them, stand by them, instruct them, and make the presence of Jesus real to them. The second promise is that he will give them his life. He will give them his life verse 19 before long the world will not see me anymore but you will see me because i live you also will live when it comes to understanding jesus words we have a great advantage over those original disciples don't we they were hearing this for the very first time at normal speaking speed whereas you and i have the opportunity to read jesus words many times over as well as the opportunity to stop and prayerfully ponder them as we do this. I wonder what the disciples made of this statement. Before long the world will not see me, but you will see me. As we look back on the events of of Jesus' death and resurrection, we can see what he was saying. He was telling the disciples that the last that the world would see of him was his death on the cross, and for a few people, his burial, but that they, the disciples, would see him again beyond the grave. Theirs would be the privilege of further fellowship with the risen Christ between his resurrection and his ascension. No unbeliever would see him on the other side of the garden, but they would. So he was referring to his death and resurrection, immediately after which he says, because I live you also will live. Now, they may have understood that right away, or maybe not. But what I think Jesus was saying to them is as a result of my dying and my rising again, you will really live. In other words, that they would enter into a new dimension of living. They would begin to share already in the resurrection life of the Lord Jesus himself. Having won that outstanding victory over sin and death and Satan at the cross, the living Lord would become the cause and the source of his followers' spiritual life. They would begin to enjoy their christ won inheritance of eternal life. Hallelujah. And that's how it is, dear friends, for every true follower of Christ. Because he lives, we live. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. You see, eternal life is not something that we're waiting for. It's something we've already begun to enjoy. As Paul put it, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I live now in the body, 
I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2 verse 20. That was Jesus' second promise. He will give them his life. Life of the third. He will leave them his peace. He will leave them his peace. In verse 27, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. What a promise this was. His peace. <laughs> that sense of peace which had enabled him to be calm in the face of endless confrontations. That enabled him to be still in the eye of the storm. A peace that gave rise to a permanent state of well-being and wholeness in the life of Jesus. The serenity of heart and mind that enabled him to go quietly to the cross. Because he knew that in dying he'd be doing the will of his father. This peace, his peace, he was leaving with them. And not as the world offers peace. That is as something desperately hoped for or worked for or something that's dependent on our external circumstances, but rather is something real and definite and readily available and totally independent of external factors. A peace that can be known in the midst of war, in the midst of the world's problems and difficulties, in the midst of its rush and its noise, its hurt and its pain, indeed, even in the midst of a plague, a pandemic, we can know this peace, Christ's peace, would ever be their portion and will ever be our portion. Your experience and my experience too. The pastor and author James Hewitt tells the story of a retired Christian couple who were so alarmed by the threat of nuclear war that they undertook a serious study of all the inhabited places on the earth. This was some time ago now, but their goal was to determine the least likely place in the world to be affected by such a circumstance. In other words, a place of ultimate security and peace where they could live life free from the threat of war. So they studied and they traveled and they traveled and they studied until they finally found such a place. And the very first Christmas they were there, they sent their pastor a Christmas card from their new home on the Falkland Islands. And within just a few months, their haven of peace and tranquility and security became a war zone. Where in the world can you and I find true, lasting peace? Answer, wherever Jesus is. Because once we receive him as our saviour and Lord, we begin to serve him and walk with him, we can begin to enjoy his undying peace, a peace that passes our human understanding, that goes beyond anything the world can possibly give. What precious gifts they were, dear friends, what tremendous bequests. Jesus promises his disciples another counsellor, one just like himself, he promised them a share in his resurrection life his, and he, he left them his abiding peace, his amazing shalom, he promised to them. So there was absolutely no reason for them to be troubled or afraid, whatever faced them in the years and the decades to come. And right now, the follower of Jesus can still enjoy all three of these things. We can experience the fullness of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. We can wake up each morning rejoicing in the fact that we share in the glorious resurrection life of Christ. And we can know that blessed sense of peace that so characterised the life of our Lord Jesus himself. Each of these wonderful blessings, together with many more, form part of our birthright as believers in Jesus. Such is the grace and the goodness of our God. Now, I guess that most of us would be more than happy to stop right there, to say a loud Amen and shut our Bibles. But we can't, or at least we shouldn't, because there's another side to this passage that's equally important. We won't take as much time over it, but it, it has to do with what the disciples 
must do for Jesus, what the disciples must do for him. Those of you with children will know that they're always ready to hear what you would like to do for them. If you've got a treat or a present for them, they're all ears, aren't they? But you've probably also noticed that would you like an ice cream seems to travel so much further than would you tidy up your room, please? And to some extent, we're all the same, aren't we? We'd much rather be told about our rights than our duties. We'd far rather hear about our benefits than our responsibilities. And I doubt the disciples were really any different. But along with Jesus' promises come a number of expectations. Mixed in with the things that he planned to do for them and for us were several things that he wanted them and us to do for him. The first one is they must obey his commands. They must obey his commands. In verse 15, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Verse 23, Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him and will come to live with him and make our home with him. Relatively easy, isn't it, to, to say that we love someone. Most of us can manage to mouth those words. I love you. But proving it. It's another thing entirely. Proving it takes time and effort. Proving it means doing things. Proving it invariably costs something. Jesus says, if we truly love him, we'll prove it by obeying his commands. A few of which immediately came to mind as I pondered this phrase. His command to be baptised was one of them. The command to love one another was another. The command to remember him in breaking bread and drinking wine, to remember his death. The command to go and make disciples was another. Those are just a few of Jesus' commands. The question is, do we love him enough to keep them? Some people might say, ah, but I don't like rules. And what's more, we shouldn't need them. Their idea seems to be that everyone would be a whole lot freer if we did away with the law entirely, if there was no such thing as rules. But hey, what would football or rugby look like if there were no rules? Chaos! What would our roads look like if there were no laws? Carnage! What would society look like if we had no body of legislation? In a word, pandemonium! I'm reading a book of daily devotionals at the moment by pastor and author Paul Tripp. And he says some very interesting things about law and grace. I read them just this week. Here's one of them. He says the one who is the final definition of love and wisdom and mercy and power makes us his slaves. He who alone is able to give us life enslaves our hearts to him. His absolute rulership over every area of our lives is not a deadening law but actually a life-giving grace. He's freeing us from our slavery to what is not true and cannot deliver, he continues. He's rescuing us from serving what will never give us life. He's protecting us from seeking hope where hope will never be found. It really is true, says Tripp. His call to obey is a tool of his rescuing grace. I love that. His call to obey him is a tool of rescuing grace. Yes, God, Jesus, has laid down certain rules, certain commands in order to protect our freedom. And if we truly love him, we'll endeavour to keep those commands because love and obedience are inseparable when it comes to loving Jesus. What else must the disciples do? Well, they must receive his peace. This next obligation is implied by what Jesus says in verse 27. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. His peace was a gift. And what do we normally do with gifts? Well, we receive them. At least that's what we normally do. We, we take the gift. We say thank you for the gift. And then we begin to make use of that gift. 
If it's clothing, we wear it. If it's chocolate, we eat it. If it's an ornament, we put it on the mantelpiece and admire it. If it's cash, we spend it or we save it. And, and the reason Jesus gives us his peace is that he wants us to make use of that peace, to take hold of it with both hands, as it were, and let it go to work. His peace is a gift to be gratefully received, to be taken and put to use in our hearts and in our minds. As Paul wrote to the Colossian Christians, he put it like this, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. So when sickness raises its ugly head, when trouble comes our way, when life seems unbearably difficult, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Remind the Lord that this is his gift to you. Say to him that you want to receive it and experience it. You don't want to be troubled. You don't want to be afraid. You want to know his peace that passes understanding. <laughs> Do you think James knew that peace as he laid his head on the axe man's block? Do you think Paul knew that peace in the dungeons of the Mamertine prison? Do you think John experienced that peace on the island of Patmos? Do you think Peter knew it as he was led out to be crucified? Do you think Wycliffe knew it, Cramner knew it, Wurmbrandt and Bonhoeffer knew it? all of whom died martyrs' deaths. If they did know that peace, <clears throat> it was only because they allowed that peace. They let that peace rule in their hearts. The peace of Christ is his gift to us, as is his salvation. But they must both be received if they're to do us any good. Thirdly and finally, the disciples must believe in him. They must believe in him. Verse 29, I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. Jesus was preparing his friends for that decisive moment when he would be taken up from them before their very eyes, never to be seen again in person, this side of the glory. His reason for telling them all of this in advance is that when it finally happens, he wants their faith to be strong. Indeed, it's essential that whatever questions they may still have in their minds, that they carry on believing, that however hard the journey might be, they continue to walk by faith. And the same is true for you and for me. We must carry on believing, trusting, looking to Jesus. And it's there I need to leave it, except to say that he hasn't left us as orphans. We have a father who sits on the throne of the universe. We have a brother in Jesus who has trampled death beneath his feet and given us his life. And we have a helper, a counsellor, a comforter in the person of the Holy Spirit who is nothing less than divine and dwells deep within us to teach us and remind us and represent us and speak for us to encourage us and to help us. So be encouraged dear friends, for God himself has made his home with you. Hallelujah. Amen.